I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Shagufa Shatran Jawali Merchant, Assistant Professor, Grantville Campus. Thank you very much, Adrian, and thank you everyone else for being here today. I'll take this moment to share my slides now. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here and uh, thank you to the TLC for providing me with this opportunity to present my work today. Um, I'm going to attempt to connect the periodic table to the planet, but with the idea of taking the learning that we get from an organic chemistry focused course into actual local action and a systems thinking perspective, uh, which would allow students to connect their learning to even global uh, global issues in the world. So, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am presenting from the unceded territories of for the Biotech Mi'kmaq Inu and Inuit of this province and very respectful of their diverse histories and cultures of these um, communities. But I also want to acknowledge that there are diverse histories and cultures of the various indigenous peoples across Turtle Island and I'm very, very respectful of those. Um, <clears throat> I also want to first write off acknowledge and thank all my students of the third year environmental chemistry uh, toxicology <clears throat> ENBS 3000 course at Grenfell campus and uh, I'm really appreciated uh, appreciative of the work they put in the enthusiasm they showed and the participation later also in the survey of this course and also I would like to thank uh, Mr Andrew King who is um, I'm more interested in the fact that he is an alumnus of Grenfell campus and that he's also the sustainable development technician at uh, with the city of Cornerbrook. And he was very, very instrumental in helping the students uh, get data from the city, uh, talk to them about the city and be a point of contact as a city representative. So what was the motivation of this study from an environmental toxicology point of view, right? So. Um, I've, I've always noticed that students are very, very passionate, really. They feel, they feel strongly about contributing towards a sustainable future. And they actually like the learning they do, but where they feel inadequate is where they do not know how to transfer that learning to actual action. And so they lack the practical tools that inform this sustainable decision making. So my motivation was to bridge that gap and actually provide two things. One, the practical tools that are used in this uh, sustainable decision-making analysis for, an for the environment, and two, provide an experiential learning platform where they could actually use that learning, apply it, and test out how this would be helpful for them in their future as environmental scientists in academia or in, um, in industry. So, the preparation for professional life was also an important um, motivation for me. And I felt that students of the class that I had, although this was a third year chemistry course, the demographic of the students were all students who were graduating this year and they were fourth year students, which meant that they were ready to step into industry or academia with the learning and be able to apply it right away hit the ground running with the knowledge and their degree. And so, therefore, the objectives of this course were actually chemistry focused because that's where this uh, environmental toxicology and chemistry sits in that cusp and that interface. So the introduction of actually looking at the chemical structure properties, physical chemical and biochemical re property relationships to predict toxicity, the fate and transport in the environment, and therefore real life hazard through real life daily activities was that overall connection that I wanted to introduce to them. And for that, the tools that were required needed them not only to understand what happens in the course at the conceptual level, but also at a level of how do I apply it to the local, um, you know, local environment and how can I connect that learning to the global environment? And therefore the systems thinking perspectives were necessary and I tried to use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a tool that would help really immediately connect what they were learning to the bigger impacts in the world. And for the life cycle thinking, 
mostly students were introduced to fate-based analysis, like this is what happens once the chemical is in the environment. But that is a very retroactive approach. And so what I wanted students to really look at is where does that chemical come from? What is its origin? What is its source? And how can we look at the entire life cycle of that chemical to be proactive decision makers and proactive local action that can eliminate or mitigate toxicity right at the start rather than looking at it at a fate-based um, solution and trying to do a cleanup of that rather than, so instead of looking at cleanup, we just look at how can we mitigate it, eliminate it, and prevent it from happening completely and use their chemistry background for that. And because it was a fourth year demographic, I wanted them to understand what accessible scientific communication really is, is what you learn that needs to be communicated in a way that can be accessible both to the city representatives and to the public in general and disseminate the knowledge in a very, very accessible manner. So th with those objectives in mind, I'd like to just introduce what is the City Studio Project. And you can very clearly see that it is from the website applying classroom learning to a real life, real world setting. And it works with experiential learning. I'm going to try and get this highlighter here going. Experiential learning techniques uh, that are applied to the real life world setting. But this is only unique to Grenfell campus. It is, um, of all the campuses at Memorial University, this project is unique to Grenfell campus and this partnership is unique with the city of Cornerbrook and unique to the environment which is Cornerbrook's environment which is different from the other parts of the world and in Canada. So that was something to remember while working on this project with environmental toxic toxicology. And all of these projects that have been, they are not, this project concept is not new. For the past six years, the City Studio projects have been applied to many environmental focus courses, and you can see even to an environmental policy graduate course at Grenfell itself. Very recently, it was applied in chemistry, but it has never been applied in environmental toxicology. And so when we uh, reached out to the city to ask them about what data could we look at, what issues would the city like to pursue with environmental toxicology for the students to really apply themselves on. And they were at a loss with that, but they were very, very receptive to the idea of let us learn about this together. And so students, that was one challenge with absolutely no background or data with the city for this kind of course. But the other challenge was that we were doing this course remotely. Now, normally, students receive on-campus lectures on urban planning, theory, and practice. But here we were doing this remotely. We didn't have access to testing environmental samples. We were not meeting. So the course lectures had to be catered to a remote synchronous learning environment, and the project had to be delivered with effective impact for the first time on this kind of course content to the city in this kind of remote learning environment, and which is where I think the students did very well. But what were the concepts that were being introduced to them also for the first time? Although the prereqs for this course require students to have a background in chemistry, a lot of the course uh, concepts were the chemical concepts were coming a little bit later because they had a very strong bio biology impact and uh, background. And so the concepts of toxicity were not so interdisciplinary in their mind where environmental toxicology is actually a very interdisciplinary field. So we introduced to them what the toxicity impacts are, what the adverse impacts are, and what does a chemical, what is the chemical's role in the adverse effects to not only humans, and which is where their focus was, humans, because they were biology-focused fo students, but then to other species in the environment as well. And the movement and the fate of the chemical in the environment through water, soil, sediment, air, and how that transport happens was something that was new to students. And then what is a toxic substance? Um, everything. Everything is toxic, and it depends on the dose. So the amount and the concentration of that chemical makes the poison. And this definition was already uh, prescribed, learned, and worked on in the 16th century, where the founder of environmental toxicology, Philippus Paracelsus, brought this idea forth 
that you can have something as common as caffeine, which we have in our diet every day. In milligrams, it fits in, it is stimulant, it's good for the body, and can be had daily over a long period of your lifetime and still not be toxic. But the moment you have a single dose of 10, 10 grams or above, it can be lethal. And similarly, you can have a very, very small amount of cyanide and you can die immediately. So the impacts of that concentration, that amount and water can actually kill you, but it would need a lot and lot and lot of it before you would die with it because it is what sustains us in life. So looking at the chemical from the different view, from a view of what does the real toxicity depend on, was something that students needed to understand before they could attempt the City Studio project, learn to apply the concepts. So toxicity actually depends on how accessible is the chemical or which can become a toxicant to you. Uh, is it being ing ingested? Is it being inhaled? Is it going through your skin as dermal penetration? And how frequently are you exposed to, to these roots, right? And finally, is it acute, long-term, chronic? And how much actual dose does, is actually absorbed by the body? And so all of that really defines what the toxic impact would be. But also, there is an individual response to that toxicity, which is an important feature. And so biology-focused students were very clued into this aspect. From the, abs from the side of the substrate, from the side of the receptor, and they were absolutely in terms of it goes to the body, goes to absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and all of those are the responses that the body has. But what does that mean in terms of actually how does that come there? It comes there because the chemical, and this is already because the chemical, the toxicant binds to the target molecule and that binding, that interaction actually and the accessibility is a later stage. It starts with the chemical properties of that toxicant. It starts with its chemical structure. It starts with the intermolecular forces of that toxicant that allow for that effective binding. It is the molecular size and the shape, whether it can be inhaled, dermally penetrated or not. Will that be then toxic if it's not available at all? And the solubility of that toxicant. So will it be transported in the water and become available to you? And what are the mechanisms that allow for that binding to happen? Are they reversible? Are they irreversible? And so all of these questions had not been considered because the focus has always been on the toxic impact at the receptor end, not at the source of the chemical. And so every chemical elicits a biological response which may or may not be toxic. And that entire outlook was something the students got very interested in learning. How did we introduce this concept of physical chemical properties that allow you to predict toxicity. So one of the things that I introduced to the course is the different types of intermolecular bonding. And then the differences in those bonding in a reductionist approach, in the way a chemist would look at it, would just be there's van der Waals, they're the weakest bonds, then there are dipole-dipole, and then there's hydrogen bonding. These are intermolecular forces. They are, uh, you know, uh, intermolecular non-covalent binding. But what is that actual impact to toxicity? What is this impact to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? From that aspect, students had never been introduced to this concept. So what we did was we looked at intermolecular forces. In this case, we have the van der Waals forces versus the hydrogen bonding forces, where the hydrogen bonding forces are the strongest intermolecular forces, but impact solubility in water. And so when it increases solubility in water, it means that it is going to be less available for fishes and aquatic species and reduce the bioaccumulation in these tissues, but have high transport in water systems. So what does that mean at the systems level, at the global level for good health and well-being and life below water? 
it actually means that it's a good thing. So having increased hydrogen bonding at the chemical level would actually mitigate bioaccumulation and toxic impacts to aquatic life. And then the introduction of green chemistry principles and qualitative principles that allow for students to actually do proactive thinking in terms of solvents. That means if I were to do chemistry or have chemicals that are coming out of our factories or industrial applications, having chemistries that are done in water with greater solubility will reduce bioaccumulation, therefore lead to a green chemistry principle of safer solvents and auxiliaries and connect it to actual environmental impacts. But at the proactive thinking, that mitigates that impact. Similarly, we looked at something that is very, very current and very important to understand, the microplastic and nanoplastic impact, specifically in Newfoundland and our waters surrounding here. And we looked at if you increase the chain length of a chemical from just one carbon, hexane, which is six carbon, and heptane, which is seven carbons, you're changing the boiling point from 69 degrees to 98 degrees Celsius, which means just one carbon attached with these two hydrogens can change the boiling point to that much difference. Now imagine when you have increased number of carbons that are in millions of carbons, which are what make our polyethylene plastics, then the important piece here is the van der Waals forces increase. And when they increase to that extent, which are supposedly the weakest forces, but with that many number of carbons in the chain length at that molecular size, it increases its interactions and reduces degradation. And that impacts how they would break down in the environment, how long they would reside in our environment, and how that would impact micro and nanoplastic formation and therefore impact life below water. And so those connections were something students really, for the first time, were looking at it from the chemical structure property for, uh, understanding rather than just microplastics are bad and they are breakdown of plastics and plastics is a dirty word. So the whole understanding really opened the view of analysis and how to look at a toxicant and its eventual impacts and how we can change those impacts. These were also connected with green chemistry principles and said if you had to make plastics you have to design them for degradation and look at the functional group and actually think about biodegradation as well. So we talked about um, these concepts, but then what were the tools that we prepared for them and provided a students to understand that? So the first thing at the fundamental level for any chemist is to look at the safety data sheet. And the safety data sheet for here, what I've shown is for chloroform, which is a very, very, common organic solvent in, in a chemistry lab. But chloroform is used very much in industry as well. Benzene has been replaced with other chemicals, but chloroform still does the job. It is a halogenated solvent, and halogenated solvents have massive impacts, toxic impacts. And so how do you start at the fundamental level for a student to look at uh, a ready, tool which is very, it's an instrument that industry uses, labs use, education, uh, you know, it is, it's prevalent in education. So a very, very common tool, but look at it from the eyes of how can this tool be applied for understanding or predicting toxicity. And so the few things that they got introduced to very clearly right at the start was section 2.1, where they could look at acute toxicity, irritation, carcinogenicity, and Example for chloroform is a carcinogen, and you can see, I think this is a very high, uh, I'll take another color, I'm sorry, is a carcinogen. So they could immediately connect right from just looking at the first few sections in an SDS, and then connect them with the globally harmonized symbols that were available in every SDS now, especially for the Canadian uh, material data sheets that you could look at it and look at the toxicity and the impacts, whether they are on the organ, whether they are on the environment, whether they are going to be corrosive, and then connect that with the physical chemical properties of the chemical. So if a chemical had 
something like a high vapor pressure, then you knew that you would probably see it in the air. If it was very soluble, you would probably see it in water. The city was also interested in knowing more about pH and what you see that some safety data sheets don't have that information. And what we also introduced to students is looking at toxicological information and ecological information. So LD50 values for toxicity tests that had been done in probably reported and are used by safety data sheets and things like toxicity to algae, which is ecological aquatic toxicity, but then also whether it would bioaccumulate in aquatic fish species and there was no data available. So as a good starting point, you could look at a safety data sheet, arrive at physical chemical properties, look at the structure and predict toxicity, even if you didn't have all of that information in a safety data sheet. But then the next important piece is to look at the regulations around it. Are there any regulations, especially with the city of Cornerbrook? Um, it's a small city, small population, does not have too many big industries, but does have the paper mill. So understanding what chemicals make up the milieu of potential toxic, uh, you know, with potentially toxic impacts that the city still doesn't know about, but then what are the regulations around it? And definitely regulations are being followed. So what regulations, what toxicity impacts, what is the rating, and what does it mean for a probable lethal dose for man if it has been tested for, say, dermal in a rat? So connecting those pieces is what students got uh, introduced to and were able to connect to physical chemical properties to their lethal doses and therefore the impact in, say, uh, man or other environmental species. Now, having chemical physical properties and also looking at, say, some regulations, what do you do with that information? And in a systems thinking perspective, I introduced the systems thinking feedback loops. So the reinforcing loops or the balancing feedback loops. What does that mean? That you can assign a polarity where the impacts are increasing and are being reinforced, but where you can actually implement regulation as something that will then create a balancing loop and become part of the solution to reduce the rates of pollutants discharge. And therefore, this introduction of regulations and connecting them into the pieces where they become part of the solution, that was a very effective way for them to actually see what the impacts are and how they're connected to the solutions, but how they're balanced versus reinforced. And that systems thinking was also introduced for them to apply. Where they didn't have information, they could actually calculate that information. And so this was the other tool that was introduced. It's a quantitative tool where some of the others were qualitative, is the life cycle assessment tool. And what we did here was to introduce to them the actual impacts of quantifiable impacts at the midpoint for, say, acidification. And uh, these are international standard uh, organization of standards for ISO 14044 and 14040 uh, metrics that were applied. And so students in this course particularly looked at acidification, persistence, bioaccumulation, and the human toxicity impacts. So acidification from any chemicals that could be dissociated at the proton, acidic proton and inorganic chemicals are big pollutants that have toxic impacts uh, in, you know, when they resettle back and are um, deposited from the air through acid rain or through other chemicals like smog. So we looked at chemical structure properties for acidification potential. We looked at the functional groups of the chemical to actually arrive at looking at would they biodegrade, would they be long lasting and what the residence time in the environment would be in the air, soil, water and whether they would bioaccumulate based on the log KOW values, the octanol water partition coefficient. And then they actually calculated human toxicity, non-cancer and cancer causing mechanisms for these chemicals which then they applied the learning to the city studio project. Here are the calculations where they did not find the data from primary literature or safety data sheets, where they could use for certification potential the molecular weights using sulfur dioxide as the, uh, you know, the denominator, which these are 
actually ISO metrics where you can normalize with these standard metrics. And persistence, whether they were looking at the functional groups of the chemical compound. So this piece was that quantitative piece in the course where they could actually quantify that impact and then recommend a solution to the city based on their calculations. And these concepts, these calculations, the practice, the introduction to the multi-compartmental model was introduced to the students right from the beginning. But while they were early on in March, before they started the actual work on their project, these were already cemented with examples, practice, uh, problems, and case studies. Here's an example of how they use this KOW learning to actually consumer products. So they had heard a lot about, and there were poster presentations that were done earlier in the course where students presented on personal care products and a potential toxicity from them. And so we said, what in those chemical products are chemicals that, and what is their chemical structure property relationship that allows you to predict toxicity? And we looked at sunscreen filters, looked at the structure, and then were able to calculate, uh, look at the KOW values and see whether they would be water soluble or not, and how they penetrate to the skin. And because of that penetration are found in plasma and in corals and therefore are banned. So they were now able to actually look at the chemical and assess it and then therefore understand why they were banned. What was the impact from the chemical structure property to the regulation that then became a solution in the systems approach and how it impacted United Nations development goal for life underwater for corals where this was banned in Florida Key West uh, because of that uh, impact to the uh, corals in that area and hormonal disruption as well has been seen for humans. So the other thing that they looked at was non-cancer toxicity of chemicals where they could calculate the non-cancer toxicity by using um, the multi-compartmental model which was introduced to them and they were able to arrive at a value and compare that with reference doses on a dose response curve that they found in literature and compare that or compare it with actual values from toluene and uh, dichloromethylene. So these kind of calculations, um, all those look complicated, but are more tedious than just complicated because once you had those values and concentrations that we had practiced, they were straightforward applied and plugged into these equations and they were able to arrive at quantifiable values. They also looked at chemical compounds in daily materials like cigarette smoke was something that was very uh, of interest to students. And so we looked at what are the different chemicals that are cancer causing? And this was a great segue into introducing why these are cancer causing compounds. And so nitrosoamines are not only present in chemicals like in cigarette smoke, even polyaromatics, but these two are chemicals also seen in charred grilled meat, so even in our food. And why are these cancer causing is because of these functional groups that go through organic chemistry reactions which students had been very well introduced to earlier and simple reactions like nucleophilic substitution by SN1 or SN2 mechanisms which students were very familiar with by the time that this, uh, this module was introduced. And they were able to look at how these polyaromatics used simple SN1 and SN2 mechanisms to attach to our DNA and damage the DNA and therefore cause cancer through mutation and DNA damage. And so students were able to now look at the chemicals, the mechanisms that lead to chemical reactivity with DNA, where those uh, electrophilic and nucleophilic reactions take place and that is the reason for cancer formation. So they were able to now connect that right at the head. With all this background in mind with the, the introduction to these concepts from the chemical toxicity in mind, what was our approach to the City Studio project? So students had been introduced to all of these concepts but how were they going to apply this? So what we did was we had the um, city representative, Andrew King, meet with the students in February itself, early February and February 11th, 
they talked about what would be of interest to the city? Are there any uh, you know things that we should think about? Um, we will start that you know brainstorming and thinking about issues that might be useful for the city in terms of environmental toxicology. I'm sorry about that. And so, uh, interestingly, the city had no background with this, and they said we may not even have enough data for you. We are interested in ammonia and the impacts to water. But other than that, we may not be able to help this. So anything you provide us would be great for us to learn and know and take forward from your data that you collect. And so students had that background of kind of like, we don't have data and we don't have any primary literature. We're going to have to try and use what we know. And so they formed their groups and started looking at areas of concern. The first thing that came out of all of this was that the city of Cornerbrook does not have a robust water purification system. So any of these emerging legacy or current use contaminants would have an impact to the fresh water system in Cornerbrook, which has the Humber River flowing through it. And so their focus started moving towards water and the access of those um, contaminants or those chemicals getting into the fresh water. And that kind of began the first thought process for them as groups to start choosing the topic they would be interested in to work with. So once they had decided what they're interested to work with, they met with Andrew King again, and they exchanged those ideas, asked him for city data, any literature that the city was privy to in these areas. They asked uh, for resources, anything that the city could provide them, and then also started doing their own primary literature search. And as an instructor, I provided them with a lot of resources on the LMS as well, including regulatory information and websites. And then uh, as the, the students progressed in their analysis for their projects, I also tried to look up active researchers in the area within Canada who could help them connect with their project and give them information. I was able to connect only one researcher to one group within the area of their research, which is interestingly, there weren't many other researchers for other areas, particularly in Canada and for local small communities such as Cornerbrook that were rural and remote and not majorly urban. And so working with Doctor, this, this is your 10 minute notice. Excellent, thank you. And so they applied those concepts that they had learned and worked on these projects from February to uh, basically in March and made virtual presentations and prepared a report as well. And they were provided, they, they worked in groups virtually, but they presented an individually written report. And this presentation was made to city representatives. The mayor was present as well. And some of our uh, Grenfell campus members were also present. Um, peer review was also a part of the course component, especially because they were going into fourth year uh, students going into industry and academia. A peer review and assessment of each other's work from the background of their learning became an important concept. Uh, concept. Here's the, the projects that the students actually chose. So here are the student uh, projects. So first one was one of current concern where they were using salt. The city uses salt for de-icing in the winter. And a lot of that gets into our waters. And is that toxic? Yes, it is established fact. Looked at legacy chemicals where earlier a lot of burials were done with formaldehyde for embalming and students worked on this to look at, is there any harm from formaldehyde from the burials that were in, uh, done in the past? And if that formaldehyde had any impact on our soils near our graveyards and would that then transport to our water systems? And then the third was an emerging contaminant, such as a tire contaminant, which is 6-PPD quinone. And how relevant is that in the current scenario of the topography of Cornerbrook and how does it translate and run off into our waters here and the impacts on, say, coho salmon, et cetera, which is of great economic importance to Cornerbrook. And so here is the project where I looked at the tire contaminant and its molecular properties. Molecular properties attach to the physical chemical properties, and you can see that they have found and calculated the biodegradation half-life, environmental residence time, and then looked at the functional groups to see whether those would biodegrade in our water. But what they've also found that the water solubility leads for all of this to actually be found mostly in waterways 
and that this compound breaks down to other transform transformation products which are also toxic to our aquatic species although may not be specifically toxic to the species found in corner brook but we don't have data for that as yet and so it was very interesting how they use life cycle impact uh, assessment and environmental impact assessment from literature and from their calculations to arrive at their data and they calculated this and presented to the city of why is it relevant to corner brook how does it impact the species that are important for corner brook and its economy and what we can do to change that and they also looked at other uh, life cycle impacts like acidification potential etc but they were not found to be extremely harmful for the other road salt use the city data was used very well but the city was able to provide waterways and water courses or tree cover in corner brook and how the students were able to use that and find out what areas in the city were being salted what had the uh, you know the easiest access into the humber river and what what that meant from the storage facility and the dumping sites so all of that data received from the city helped inform the analysis to then look at the toxicity of excess salt in our waters as runoff into the Humber River and what it would mean for our uh, waterways and what it would mean for the economy of our city, Corner Brook, in terms of corrosion, et cetera, especially for vehicles. So that was another aspect the students really worked well with. And one other interesting thing was in the embalming project, they found that their calculations led them to understand that actually the formaldehyde that although was available in the soil was really not of high concentration, which is very low concentration and not harmful to our environment. But where there was no data available, they looked at other cities in the USA that may have similar data and they were able to find some from Halifax but none from our area. So that really helped them work with what they had and arrive at the calculations the best that they could. And so they were very clearly able to identify the knowledge gaps and potential of where these studies need to go and what they should offer as alternatives to the city. So they were able to discuss the barriers, the knowledge gaps, and then also talk about alternatives, which was the very interesting part for us and to recommend to the city from other um, you know, data that was found for alternatives also, where they were studied in certain other US cities with other alternatives, but no data really for Canada or for small rural populations. Here's the emerging contaminant. They presented not only what we can do today, but what we can do as citizens through a citizen science program and what we can do in the future. If this is a problem for our city, then what we should consider in terms of biofiltration and actually investing in the current public transport system. So they were really, really important and very practical solutions that were being presented. What did they learn from it? That this definitely helped them identify the problem for real life environmental issues. The majority was all in the eight to 10 region that they found this helpful. I have a class of 11, only six students responded, may not be fully representative, but gives us a fair idea of how this city studio was applied to their learning. And then you can see that did they find the course uh, integration of this helpful and they really found this was helpful to apply their learning concepts. So they were very, very interested in actually putting that experiential learning into practice. Then did they think that it helped environmental and citizen helping? They definitely agreed all from seven to 10 that this was, this allowed them to reconsider old faith-based approaches and think proactively towards citizen well-being. And that um, would, would these, this empower them to actually, uh, you know, make a difference towards a safe city of Cornerbrook, and you can see overwhelmingly they agreed that this really empowers them to make that difference. And um, all the tools that they learned, they were able to apply them, were very useful for them, and it helped them actually take that skill to industry and commerce. As you can see, most of it is in very well, they were very well able to pick that up and take it forward for industry and commerce. So that was very uh, heartening to see. And 
Um, surprisingly, it was a bit of a distribution in the upper level, though, that would they be able to see these kind of partnerships more in other courses or in this environmental science teaching curriculum. And there was across the board, but on the higher side of, yes, they would like to see it. And although systems thinking is not intuitive for students, I found that if they were able to connect these things it, in toxicology practice, I think that is an extremely useful thing to take forward and build on and help students build on this application of their learning to bigger uh, issues. I've already discussed the challenges that they faced, but I think we could make a change once we're back in person, do actual testing and have uh, different group study uh, orientation. And I think that might be a better solution for that. And some of the things that I've already mentioned were highlighted in student feedback that there was limited information, but the city had limited data. There were not many papers that focused on largest. Uh, there were papers that focused on larger city centers, but not for Conibrook kind of uh, population. And they learned about scientific communication and also that they became more aware of root salt and how would they apply it in their real life? Like I'm more aware of my vehicle use. I go out for a walk and I think of uh, you know citizen science and I apply that learning to other interdisciplinary courses as well. And so I thought that overall this was a good start to this concept of teaching and hopefully we will be able to take our learning from here and apply it to other um, you know apply it and make it better. So I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much for your perfectly timed uh, presentation, Doctor. It's uh, three o'clock. We have exactly 15 minutes left for questions. Now, we don't have any questions in the chat, uh, so I don't know if I can encourage anyone to write one in or to share with us here in the room. I'm sorry, I'm just going to stop sharing so I can see, uh, but I can reshare when I'm answering the question. Uh, doctor, do you see the questions there? Did you want me to uh, call them out for you? I'm I'm checking them in the chat just now. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, Erica, I see your question about. Thank you. I'm glad. Uh, I I I thought the class was fun too, and so did the students. So that's really interesting. Um, so the environmental toxicology class has no labs, and since it's an interdisciplinary uh, course where students from biology, chemistry, all take it together as that interface. Uh, there is no particular lab that they do, but um, understanding from practical methods are introduced uh, during the course. However, for this course, the students came uh, with um, a biology focus and they were doing chemistry. Some of them were doing chemistry simultaneously as well. So uh, that was the thing that was trying to balance in terms of teaching chemistry, not uh, you know, assuming that they had an implied knowledge. But other than that, they didn't have other practical labs for this course. Um, do you think there is a possibility to build some of these projects with future cohorts? Um, I think one of the things that we definitely, uh, so the city of Cornerbrook has expressed their interest to continue working on uh, with uh, the future cohorts on this course. And um, they're also very interested in working with uh, students for uh, say other chemistry kind of uh, integration uh, and they're waiting for us to tell them how that might be helpful. But I've also felt that um, not only just the city of Cornerbrook, but this kind of experiential learning lends itself well to say other uh, partners as well. So there could be more than one partner or there could be other partners that would allow even community groups and engagement to community, um, in, you know, involvement to understand the different aspects of this kind of learning. I, I'm wondering if that answered your question, but um, I think future cohorts definitely. Thank you. Yeah, I guess we can, uh, should we call this last call for questions, doctor? Does that seem appropriate? Absolutely. Uh, 
at your discretion, whatever you deem fit. I'm I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any more. I have another question, so I don't type fast enough. I think. Um, so uh, with the with the uh, ideas that you're putting forward, the concepts that you're putting forward, as you as you mentioned, you can't assume that they have a background in chemistry. Uh, and so I see so much of this could be a fantastic motivation and a more interesting way to uh, to learn and apply these concepts in a first year chemistry course. So do you think that some of the stuff you do could be adapted as a module within first year chem when we're doing, for example, intermolecular forces or to have a module in the lab about uh, the SDS? So that's very interesting that you bring this up, Erica, because actually uh, some of the work that I did here, I'm also trying, it was my own little way of doing a soft pilot. I'm part of the American Chemical Society's Green Module Development Program, where um, the work that um, I'm involved with is actually introducing into molecular forces and systems thinking in the first year chemistry courses, so Gen Chem. And, uh, there has been work done on this, but uh, the the work I was doing was like I wasn't I was new to Grenfell and I wasn't yet teaching first year chemistry here, so um, the concepts that we had introduced there lent itself very well to this uh, class as well. Now, having said that, this is not a first year Gen Chem class, but the background of the students here was really introductory, especially with organic chemistry, and so. Um, even with the Gen Chem, this was going to be assumed that they would have been introduced to some organic chemistry concepts, and then this would be introduced to them in the second half of the first year. So with the same background in mind, I think this was introduced as if it was meant for introductory level systems thinking and toxicity uh, impact. So this can this can very well be introduced even in the first year. Thank you, Karen. That uh, <laughs> one thing I realized with introductory organic chemistry also that um, we walk into a lab, we follow a procedure, we have students write lab reports on it. But when you actually think about this SDS, they really don't know how to look for it. And so when it's sitting in a lab in a physical form, it's not something they walk in and check. But once you integrate it into a lab report, then it becomes a tool for having a great green chemistry conversation. And so introducing uh, sustainable concepts through the SDS is very valuable. <laughs> uh, I I'm not sure whether um, I think the fact that the person was an alumnus, Erica, really brought in the passion and the understanding of what happens at Grenfell and that interdisciplinary outlook from, um, you know, environmental sciences that were more policy oriented or otherwise, but didn't have a chemistry background. So they tied those in well, the science environmental versus policy environmental. And so those things were helpful. Um, and I think one other thing was helpful was that this person already had done uh, some kind of work like this while he was at Grenfell. So um, being able to say that, you know, this data from the city might be useful for you, uh, but uh, there is no other data. So maybe we can connect that conversation becomes easy when, you know, you're you're from the same background and the approachability increases. So I think overall that was helpful from that aspect. Uh, would that be more difficult to get the partnership going without that? Um, I didn't think about it directly because uh, when I walked, uh, when I, I started with this course, uh, City Studio as um, an available option for us to integrate in our courses was very interesting as an idea to me, and I was willing to try it out from my my course. But I had not really thought about uh, other partners at this point. I just like, okay, this is a very interesting experiential learning platform. It is available at Grenfell. Let me see how it lends itself to environmental toxicology. Um, 
But this does definitely inspire me to seek out other partnerships as well for experiential learning. Like I said, community groups, other uh, industrial partners for other courses. Uh, and I, I think it really uh, enhances student learning and application.